action goals. And she actually has some slides and a presentation. So we're very lucky to have her. So Chelsea, if you want to take it away. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, here we go. Okay. Can you guys see everything? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's yes, full screen. Okay. Yep. Well done. Um, Okay, so technology. Um, so um, it seems, uh, I think goal setting is something that um, we've all probably um, heard of at, at some point, um, whether it just be um, setting your goals for the week to, you know, do your laundry and get to the grocery store or, um, you know, more like a, a big long-term project. Um, I'm sure you've had goals there as well. Um, but um, it seems pretty basic, but it's something that's very important to revisit um, in terms of working towards um, building effective organizations that uh, with a, a strong community impact. So we're going to kind of be um, going through goals and goal setting. Um, so first step, um, it's always good to revisit, what, what is a goal? Um, so of course it's, it's going to be um, an object to which uh, effort, effort and ambition is directed. Um, so it's the destination of your journey, uh, making sure that your goal is always in alignment with um, your organization's mission. Um, and the purpose of setting goals is always going to be, um, again, a similar, um, similar reason to advance your, your mission um, through your organization. So in this case, um, it's going to help with um, organizing, um, organizing your efforts and tracking your progress, um, but also for communicating what your organization is striving for. So um, there are a few types of goals that are short-term immediate goals. Um, pretty self-explanatory. Um, immediate is going to be the relatively foreseeable future um, is still out in the distance than long-term goals over longer periods of time. So um, for um, each type of these goals, we're going to be going through um, action items and the, the uh, action goals, um, so SMART goals. How are we going to be creating goals for long-term goals, short-term goals, and immediate goals? Um, so um, all goals should be SMART. Um, this acronym is again applicable to every type of goal you'll be setting. Um, so first S is for specific. You want to make sure that your goal is clear. Um, so what you want to accomplish includes what you want to accomplish, why it's important, and who's going to be involved. Um, you can see an example there. Um, not a great goal would be um, something that is not specific. So the organization must accrue 100 new members by way of social media. Um, not not very specific. Um, however, on the right. Um, let me just move everyone's faces so I can read it. Um, by the end of 2016, the communications team will establish social media accounts on Twitter and Facebook to promote events and workshops in the cities of our five locations to increase awareness and active membership to promote meaningful change. So you can see this is very specific, uh, much more in depth, tells you who is involved, um, what's going to be accomplished, uh, why it's important, um, everything that's necessary for a specific goal. And um, then we have measurable goals. Um, measurable goals um, need to be clear. Um, they have to have concrete criteria for measuring your progress towards attaining a certain goal. So um, again, example at the bottom, um, instead of you know, a broad overview of um, what, you, what your ideal, um, you know, what your, your ultimate goal is, it's important to flesh that out so it's clear um, as to how are we going to measure our progress as an organization? How are we going to know where we are at in attaining that goal? Um, it's easier to say, oh, we're halfway there because we've hit this number versus I think we're doing okay. So um, moving on to A um, and SMART goals, uh, goals should all be attainable. Um, so they should be realistic and achievable um, given the, the time frame that you have and the resources that are available to you. So in this case, um, um, silly example, uh, take out a small loan <laughs> to ship 1,000 introductory information packets to potential members by tomorrow morning. Um, that's not, you know, that's not necessarily the most practical, um, not something that you may want to be doing is taking out small loans and then shipping 1,000 um, packets overnight. Um, however, sending out 1,000 emails, um, you know, using technology um, by Friday, that's, that's much more attainable, much more realistic. Um, so if you know, if your goals are not attainable, it's going to set yourself up for failure. So it's important that um, every goal is realistic. Um, and then relevant. Um, so the goal should also be re relevant. Um, they should support and align with your other goals. Um, you know, 
in this case, um, posting a photo collage of the team lunches to Instagram and Facebook by today at 3 p.m. Might, uh, might be lots of fun, might be a cool way to use technology and social media, but not necessarily the most relevant to your mission. Um, so again, making sure that um, everything, every goal that you set is uh, relevant to the, the mission of the organization. And then lastly, time bound. Um, so it can be very easy to enter into um, an organization um, and set goals that may not, uh, that may be kind of distant, far off. Um, so um, in this, the example here, determine the funding needs and propose a budget for the 2016 fiscal year. Um, that could happen at any time. Um, that could happen tomorrow, or next week, or um, you know, maybe the night before the deadline. Um, but that's not necessarily the way that um, goals should be created. Um, instead, it's best to um, develop um, time frames um, and uh, an ultimate deadline for these goals. So it's going to help with um, organizing uh, what needs to be done and when, um, and it will also have a definite date of completion. So um, to recap, um, the SMART goals, um, they can, the SMART guidelines back here in the beginning, um, they can apply to all types of goals. So making sure that they are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. So, um, does anyone have any questions for me? Any questions for Chelsea? Yeah. How do I move it? Okay. No? Well, that was very thorough, very good. So thank you so much, Chelsea, no for that. Thank you. Um, and if anyone asks, like, thinks of any questions that they want to get to, please just write it in the chat, and Chelsea, I'm sure, can message back. Great, um, thank you. Yeah. Um, but we actually have our first other guest speaker um, joining us. Her name is Mackenzie Thomas, and she's an Associate Product Marketing Manager at Google. Um, and she's going to talk a little bit about nonprofit activism and elections. And we're very lucky to have her. So. Mackenzie, if you want to take it away. Thank you. Um, really appreciate being able to join you all tonight. Um, as mentioned, um, I currently work for Google on our search product marketing team. So help I help a lot of engineers and other people cross-functioning to, to launch different features um, around search. And that's everything from things as, uh, you know, day-to-day -day as weather and sports features to then more often than not, things around civics and social impact. So around our crisis response, elections, things like that. So I have, let me present my slides to you. Are you able to see them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So I think that this overall topic of how do we engage the unengaged is something that we at Google have been tackling and then primarily outside of Google as well. And I think it's important for us as activists and individuals to think about this question. Um, how do we go beyond the people within our intimate circles and also look to engage folks around the world who just need a little bit of a, a nudge or something of the sort? So with that, uh, I think it's good to remember that social change happened before the internet, um, before things like Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter dominated our lives. Um, you know, if, if we go through each hour, there's some degree of social activist movement. Um, that said, I think that there is definitely power that the internet uh, can lever that we can leverage as activists to propel this social change that we're looking for. So for you know, things like what we saw in the Arab Spring a few years back. Um, you know, Twitter has an amazing microphone and megaphone aspect, and Facebook is also being used as well to connect with other people. Um, and I think we're just going to continue to see this, um, this focus on social media and also on the Internet to be used as, um, as a means to propel our, our messages. Um, that said that there's also downside, so I think it's important to be honest with ourselves as to what, what power we uh, as you know, bodies together need to have versus what power the internet alone can have. Um, so with that, I think you know, we, we think about this term, slacktivism versus meaningful change. Um, and I think that 
like I mentioned, selectivism has some degree of, of a role that it's important to be able to take your idea and um, sp spread it out to the audience. And there's multiple audiences that exist uh, around the world. There's some people that want to know what's going on um, on a basic level and just want to get the, you know, 140 character updates. And there's other people that want to be in, engaged on a deeper level. And we um, can figure out a way to harness both of those and work with both of those through social media. Um, and then I think that the meaningful change is important because we can, we can definitely think about um, how do we use the open nature of the web to be able to you know, spread videos on YouTube that, um, of things that otherwise we never would have been able to see um, around the world to be citizen reporters as well in our own right. Um, so with that, there's these five different areas of the civic ladder that we've identified in some research at, at Google. Um, and if you see these top three, organizing, protesting, and campaigning, and voting are all taking actions in person that require a little bit more of a push um, and go beyond the, the internet. And then at the, you know, the bottom two of signing a petition and sharing an opinion are two pieces that most people are very willing to take, right? You're, it's a pretty easy action to be able to, um, you know, change your Facebook picture or retweet something of the like. So this area in the, in the bottom are primarily folks that we call our interested bystanders. So they care about the issue, but they don't necessarily know to, how to move from the bottom pillars to the top three. Um, and with that, I think that's the piece that around the world we're trying to figure out how do we capture, how do we bring from, um, you know, sharing a basic opinion or sharing, you know, various opinion online to then saying, I'm going to, because I care about education or because I care about immigration, I'm now going to go out and vote. Um, so it's important to think through these five, five different, um, you know, wrongs on this ladder and say, how do, how do I get people to move up the ladder, um, but realize that for someone to go from sharing an opinion online to jumping to organizing is going to take usually a while, or it's going to take a lot of passion from them. Um, and then, of course, you know, I think that with Facebook, Twitter, and the, you know, Snapchat, et cetera, these many different social medias, um, we, we realize that these same interested bystanders, that's about 50% of the population, really do want to have a voice online, um, but they don't necessarily know how to channel that voice. And many times they're worried that, you know, they're not experts in the field, um, nor are they, or, or they're also worried about, um, you know, disrupting the, the norm or upsetting people online. So they many times can be, be you know, silenced and many times don't know how to, you know, even get their voice out there, but they want to. So with that, um, I think it's important for organizations to think about what are those snippets that are easily digestible that people can share um, that, you know, at, you know, at Google, we do this, does it pass the, the mom or grandma test, right? Like does your product um, and your slogan or your mantra, would you be able to have explain over Thanksgiving dinner what, uh, you know, you're, you're actually doing and would your grandmother be able to reiterate that to another relative. And if the answer is yes, then you're in good hands. I think you've done a good job of simplifying that enough to capture the larger audience. Um, and then another thing to think about and remember is, a, you know, design thinking principle of focus on the user. I think that this makes sense in the entities of when you're starting an organization or building a product, we really focus on um, that as we're thinking about new products or new services at, at Google and beyond, and also, but also I think think about who the user is for your social campaigns. And those two may be very similar, um, or many times they may be very different, right? Like your users may be a specific um, community, but then in fact, when you're doing fundraising efforts or things of the sort, you want to take that community and really spread their voices um, and get other people involved. So I think thinking about those two things as separate or you know, equal when, when they are is super important. And definitely something uh, to think about. So this idea of focus on the user and all else will follow is what we champion a lot. And um, from there, if you work with the users and work with who your target population is to identify the need, and I think that if there's a disparity between who that user is and who your uh, community is for your organizing goals, think about how do you connect the two and how do you make sure that your 
user's voice is honest and available throughout that process. So three um, instances where I think that this was done really well. On the left-hand side of the screen are our two Google Now cards that um, we showcased. Um, the back one is a tornado warning that was in central Illinois um, you know, a while ago. And with that, we're pushing this warning and the appropriate information to users right when they need it at that moment. So we're thinking about what are those, what does the user need as opposed to what do we as a company need? And then this on the, in the forefront, we see this early voting card um, that was done two years ago, or sorry, last year. Um, and with that, we, we realized that a lot of people just don't know where, where they can vote early or where they can register to vote. And with that, we say, here's a quick little um, hint and a quick little nudge, and people are able to act on that because they realize that this is what they need, and we've identified that on the other end. In the middle is the It Gets Better project, which I'm sure many people know. Um, and when Dan Savage and his partner Terry started this project at, um, five years ago, they realized that their target population was LGBT youth and identified this. Um, and the video was to a very specific audience. And because of the specificity and also the fact that it really captured uh, an emotive nature or was you know very emotive that aspect alone carried it and really grew the movement um to what it is today five years later um so really specific target audience focused on what that user what that you know audience particularly needs then on the right we have something that is obviously uh you know very recent in paris uh where airbnb has done this great thing where people can offer their residences residencies for, um, you know, Parisians or visitors to be able to stay in if they felt unsafe. Um, so moving on, this question of even if I do something, will anything actually change uh, is super important to think about and definitely something that um, I as an activist, but also someone who uh, can be on, you know, both ends, thinks about very frequently. And I think that you know, if you're looking at a campaign or something on Indiegogo or change.org, those are the real questions that you want answered. Um, so with that, I would make sure that there, that you think about these three specific things. So one, that there's a clear call to action. So when someone either goes to your website or goes to your Facebook or Twitter account, that they know exactly what they're going there to do. What is the purpose of the campaign and how do you make sure, just like in the presentation prior, that there are these smart and actionable goals? Um, and then throughout the process of the campaign, most campaigns are not necessarily one and done or very quick. Um, it's an elongated process. So making sure that you update your supporters. I think, like I mentioned, Indiegogo and change.org and Kickstarter as well, though for usually non-activist um, projects is really great at this. And they all give you that um, capabilities to be able to constantly update the people who are supporting you. But I would remember this, whether or not you're using those services and think about that um, for your tweets or for your Facebook posts or emails as well. People want to stay in the loop and they want to know what um, what's actually going on and what their signature really meant. And that's okay for also for shortcomings too. So don't be afraid to be honest um, as to if something failed and why it failed. Um, and then Finally, highlighting success stories. We've been working with um, here at Google on this project called Accelerate.LGBT with WordPress and their parent company, Automatic. And with that, we've highlighted some great LGBT nonprofits and small businesses that have really grown um, and are trying to continue to succeed thanks to the internet. And people love that. And it also creates this community by which um, others want to share your stories too. So you uh, you know, everyone wants their stories and successes elevated. So making sure if you're doing that for your constituencies, they're more willing to share this as well. And it's done in a meaningful way. And finally, um, amplifying your message in three ways, thinking about partnerships. Um, once again, the, I think the It Gets Better project has done this really well, that they've partnered with Uber and actually the Doritos recently. So if you saw those rainbow colored Doritos, It Gets Better partnered with them on that. Um, and thinking about how other corporations can 
and organizations can align together around uh, the Sochi Olympics. Melissa Etheridge led this large project called Uprising of Love, where she banded together, you know, hundreds of celebrities and nonprofits and different influencers and activists around um, LGBT rights to light of the Olympics being in Russia um, and made it from being, you know, her as a one single celebrity to now you have the messages of, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people. And similarly, you saw that with uh, American Apparel and Athlete Ally around that same time. So I think thinking about what those key partnerships can be, and sometimes it's with organizations that are so far from your immediate mission, but are able to do, bring something to the table that you can. Second, uh, timing. So thinking about what's that exact moment that you can align with. Obviously, large organizations and companies can do this uh, a little bit easier than nonprofits, but if there's a topic or conversation that's happening or if there's a timely moment, um, think about that and think, okay, can I write a blog? Can I post something on HuffPo or Medium? And think, and just due to the timeliness of it alone, it will gain traction. So, you know, we have Giving Tuesday coming up in a few weeks. That's a great moment for nonprofits to say, oh, this is what we're doing around Giving Tuesday. This is our sort of year in review. And then finally, um, like all good things, make sure you're genuine um, and honest in your your social um, impact work. And usually that will be able to, you know, propel things forward. So thank you so much. Um, Here's my contact information if anyone had any additional questions too. Thank you so much, Mackenzie. That was great. Very informative and definitely helpful to me um, because we're launching actually an Assam Connect Instagram campaign. Oh, perfect. Took a lot awesome. of notes. Yeah. Um, but does anyone have any questions for Mackenzie? Any questions? <laughs> no. Okay. Well, I can, I can go first. I have a question. Sure. Um, do you recommend from your experience any specific social media platform um, for to carry out nonprofit activism, like Facebook versus Twitter, or YouTube, YouTube over Instagram? Mm-hmm. Or would you kind of recommend going on to all multiple platforms? Yeah, so I think that that's a great question. And I would say um, that they're all very different and for very different reasons. Yeah. Um, I think mm-hmm. that, you know, Twitter primarily, in my opinion, founded on that sort of one-to-many um, aspect and the ability to use it as a megaphone to spread your message. Um, it, mm-hmm. I also love it actually more so in the for the customer support um, reasons as well. So I yeah. frequently tweet at airlines when there's issues. So I think that if you're launching some campaign and there's specific like funding questions that could come up, that's a great reason to do that. Um, yeah. I think Instagram is obviously, you know, focused around photos. And if you're able to mm-hmm. capture, um, that aspect of things, I think it's really, it's really great. Um, we all sort of, I think, know the, the Facebook, um, pros and cons as well, yeah. um, mm-hmm. that the ability to immediately share things is, um, probably one of the utmost, um, you know, share and like things are, you know, super important for Facebook. Um, but I would suggest really focusing on and diving pretty deep into one, maybe two of them, especially if you're a small mm-hmm. organization. Um, and more often than not, I'd say like what you need to do on one is very different from the other. So making sure that you're not necessarily just replicating, oh, we launched our campaign today. Yeah, Here's definitely. those 10 things you can do and sending that over every single, you know, platform. <laughs> yeah. um, and also I would say start your own blog. Um, I think that that's super meaningful and kind of is cross-platform then. You're able to share those stories um, and share those success stories and also share learnings as well. And as individuals, I think it's a great way to then like use as sort of a portfolio for what you end up doing later if you move away from it, your organization. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions from anyone from Mackenzie? I have a question. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, so one thing that is challenging about social media is that we see the news that we expect to see. Like right. our, our community <laughs> feeds back to us what we assume our community is. So I'm curious if you have any examples of really successful social media campaigns that really get beyond whoever the target audience is or mm-hmm. what are some of the qualities that kind of help um, move beyond just sharing with the people that we already know, hearing back what we already believe, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think that that's a, a really, really great question. And some of the most, like, definitely some of the most viral campaigns have 
I mean, I, I hate to call upon this example all too much, but everyone obviously knew what happened with the ice bucket challenge. And um, that was something that was very untraditional in its, uh, you know, activism. Um, but it was a little bit flashy and it did what it needed to do. I think that that the piece around um, timeliness is usually what I would, you know, think about as well. Like, where is that moment that you can latch on to, even if it's just a, a seemingly random national blank day or international blank day, because other people are talking about that and caring about that. Um, and sometimes it just takes like one quick, uh, you know, share or the like. Um, and then kind of thinking about what these other partnerships are as well. I think that that, you know, that last slide that I was looking at um, and showcasing are, are those kind of main, uh, main things to think about. Um, I can't think of any other, other really good examples, but I would say, you know, do think about what, what are the messages that get beyond your immediate circle. And yes, I think as activists, sometimes it's like a little bit less, uh, it can seem like a little bit more shallow or it can seem like you're only giving the bare bones, but what is frankly something that's going to catch someone's eye and then what would get them reading further, right? Um, I have a love-hate relationship with like listicles and these things, um, but they certainly do that and they're able to grab someone's attention and then kind of move them forward. I'll think on that for, for you though. And if I think of anything else, I'll send it your way. Great, thank you. Um, any last questions from Mackenzie? Any last thoughts? Mackenzie, do you have any last thoughts? <laughs> Uh, no. Uh, if anyone has any other questions or things that come up or anything that we can help with, more than happy to assist. Well, thank you again so much for joining us. Of course. Great. <laughs> thank you. Um, and so our, our next speaker is um, going to be Cheryl Conti, co-founder and CEO of Vision Strategy. Um, she's supposed to be here at 9.30 and it's 9.29. So um, one minute. Am I oh, early? Oh. You want me to log oh, on? Oh, no, you're great. No, no, no. Perfect timing. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I know um, it's a little dark in here. <laughs> I can try and get better light. Um, <laughs> yeah, we can still see you. It's okay. A little better. Uh, yeah, so it's really great to uh, have a chance to speak with so many amazing people. Um, the work <laughs> that you're doing with Asylum Connect is incredible. And so oh, thank you. Thank yeah, you so much. <laughs> it's really an honor to have a chance to speak with you. So I can tell you a little bit uh, about what I do, um, mm -hmm. if that's of interest to you guys. Yeah, sounds good. Perfect. So I'm Cheryl Conti. Uh, and I am the co-founder and CEO of Fission Strategy, like nuclear fission. Uh, and Fission is a digital agency that specializes in helping the world's leading nonprofit foundations and social enterprises uh, to use the internet in more inspirational and innovative ways to change the world. Uh, and so we work with, I would say, medium to large organizations or organizations that are planning to start at zero and get to 60 uh, very fast and build a, a, mass, a mass online movement. So some of the things that we've been uh, a part of um, helping, uh, for example, one of my close friends, Jose Antonio Vargas, is in a sense an LGBT asylum seeker. Jose Antonio Vargas was a very well-known uh, tech journalist, uh, a Pulitzer Prize winner, and he came forward uh, a few years ago to say, look, I'm also um, an undocumented worker. Um, and so together we helped him to found Define American. Uh, Fission actually provided all of the um, back office and behind the scenes support uh, for several years. Of course, now Define American has its own staff. Um, it has, um, you know, a great presence. But, you know, in the early days, it was very much a gray area. Um, you know, his status and whether or not he would be safe, whether we would be safe and in, in helping him um, was really uh you know, unclear. Um, but I'm really proud of the work that we've done uh, with Jose um, and with his team at Define American. Uh, through Define American, it really put a different face on the movement for immigration reform. 
Um, it uh, also really pressed the Obama administration really hard and some of the uh, things that happened in terms of greater rights for dream activists, um, stopping or, or putting a stop to deportations of non-criminals. Uh, some of those things were um, really, really tied back to Define American. So that's some of the work that we do at Fission. I'm also the co-founder of Attentively. Attentively is actually a tech product. Uh, we take big email lists of donors, activists, supporters, and we um, we create that we match it to public social media data. Then we create a, a dashboard that reveals who your top influencers are with hidden within your list. We almost always find famous people uh, in people's lists. Uh, people have no idea, you know, how powerful um, individuals can be now. Individuals like you who, you know, each of you has, you know, an, an audience that you have built and a community that you have built and are power, more powerful than you might imagine. So I'm one of three black women in American history to have attracted more than two million in angel capital to date, uh, which is exciting. And out of that effort, uh, I learned a lot um, about the land of Silicon Valley and, and startups. And so um, from there, uh, I worked with Van Jones, who's a very famous activist and uh, political commentator and a friend of mine, to create Yes We Code. And Yes We Code represents the movement to help over 100,000 low opportunity youth of many colors to become high quality, quality coders and technologists. Because my job is awesome. And uh, the team I work with is amazing. And there's so much opportunity. Uh, it really is the, the, the career um, of the of the next century. So those are you know some of the the little activities I'm up to. Some people also know me as the co-founder of Jack and Jill Politics, which no longer runs, but it was a well-known um, black political blog during the 2008 and 2012 elections. So I'll stop talking um, and would love to hear from you guys any questions you might have. Um, well, first, thank you so much. Um, that was very interesting, and I'm sure there'll be questions for you. Um, does anyone want to start with the first question for Cheryl? Well, I, I have a question. Um, we take questions from participants anonymously before the webinar. It's kind of a broad question. Um, but someone asks, how can nonprofits use technology to leverage their message and engage more people to create the most impact? Absolutely. I mean, it's what we do every day. Uh, the first thing that we do when we work with uh, a new nonprofit or a foundation is understand, okay, what are your overarching goals? Beyond your immediate message now, what are you actually trying to achieve in the world? Uh, and then we look to, to do some audience research. Almost always, there's an existing audience out there that shares those same goals, that shares those same values. And so we look to see you know, who are the leaders and influencers online um, around that conversation or around that goal? Um, what are their, um, what types of hashtags are they using? What types of keywords? Um, do you have an existing base of people that you're already talking to? Sometimes that's yes, sometimes that's no. So we work together to figure out, okay, who are you trying to influence? Um, what are you trying to achieve and then create a strategy around that? Then once you have a strategy, you can then start to apply what are the actual, what's the actual technology that we can, that either exists today or that we have to build in order to help you, you know, propel this campaign forward. Great. Thank you. Um, anyone have any questions? Yep. Chelsea, I see hand. Yep. Go ahead, Chelsea. So um, I work with um, uh, first generation low income students started a nonprofit um, to um, assist them in um, not necessarily getting into higher education. Um, that number is low, but, um, but actually completing uh, their pursuits in higher education. Um, however, um, we've, you know, as we're like working on this fundraising and everything um, and kind of spreading awareness, um, a lot of our issues um, that we've been facing have been um, finding people who are invested in the mission um, for like financial support, of course, but uh, resources, that kind of thing. Um, and it can be very difficult because our target demographic, like the, the 
subjects of our work um, are not necessarily in a position where they can be providing that um, that kind of support that we're looking for. So um, one of our big um, issues has been expanding um, not so much the awareness, but the like the support base that we do have. Like how do uh, using like social media um, or technology how um, to I guess get people who are who may not have any like who may not be stakeholders in the issue. How do we get them involved and like uh, committed to it? Um, I don't know if you have any insight into that. Absolutely. I mean, again, it's it's definitely a thing that most people are are looking to do is say, look, here's an issue. Most people don't know about it, or they may not feel connected to it. You know, how can we enlarge the community? How can we bring that awareness to them and hopefully enlist them in helping us? And, um, you know, one of the principles that I've adhered to that seems to work is, is really treating people like people. Too often, you know, what I find is that nonprofits in particular, you know, they, they, even though they don't mean to, you know, they often see people as a means to an end or treat people as a means to an end. And I think if you really invite people in to co-create the, the campaign with you and say, look, you know, here's what we're trying to do. Here's what we need. How could you help? Right. Instead of just demanding like, hey, here's a list of things that we need. Go do this. Go do that. Go do this. You know, if you're able to, you know, first educate people, you know, get people intrigued and then, you know, in as human a way as possible and, you know, using storytelling, right, really creating a protagonist, you know, a, an arc for that protagonist, um, you know, start to involve people in seeing themselves as heroes in that story, right? As people who can actually take, rather than just being like another, you know, faceless cog, you know, pushing a button and signing a petition, right? People are capable of so much more than that. Great, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I actually had a follow-up question to that. Um, I was wondering, in your opinion, for digital strategy, how do you keep the, how do you get the public's attention, but after you have the attention, do you have any insights on how to stay relevant or how to get um, someone to follow your organization past that kind of honeymoon phase? Right, no, and it's something, that's a really insightful question. A lot of people don't think past, you know, this immediate campaign that they need to get results on and then, you know, they erode their audience or they have to rebuild it all over again for the next campaign. Um, you know, people, again, people behind every mouse click, right, behind every reblog or um, like or share or comment or heart is a living, breathing human being that in that moment is expressing themselves in a very meaningful, what they consider to be a meaningful way. Right. And so, you know, when you treat people that way and respect, you know, when they have shared something, you know, a simple way to keep people involved is to actually thank them, is to let them know the results over time of what they've done and to thank them. Right. And to let them know, hey, we have this thing coming up in a month or two or, you know, a few weeks. You know, we'd love for you to get involved. Click here if you think you'd like to continue being involved. I mean, creating that narrative arc for people where they feel like they are not just taking an action in that moment, but they're a part of a story. Right. They're a part of a movement or, you know, a momentum is happening that they are an instrumental part in uh, helping to bring to the world. That's how you keep people hooked. Thank you. Um, any, any last questions for Cheryl? <laughs> um, well, any last thoughts from you, Cheryl? Sure. I mean, um, you know, talking about LGBT asylum, it's something that, um, you know, I have been keen to work on. Obviously, mm -hmm. you mentioned the work with Jose, but right. we recently welcomed onto our team Michael Nabil uh, Sanad. Uh -huh. um, who um, was an Egyptian blogger. He was actually jailed during the Egyptian revolution. He's now a fellow with us. He oh. left Egypt to seek asylum here in the United States um, and is to a certain extent starting his life over after being, you know, mm -hmm. speaking out and being tortured, you know, yeah. really being persecuted. Uh -huh. um, you know, uh, he was actually a Nobel Prize um, nominee. Uh, oh, wow. 
well. Yeah. yeah. So it's, okay. it's been an honor to have him on the team, both to learn from him um, and also, you know, to hopefully give him some additional experience um, and, and a breadth of knowledge that he can take, um, mm -hmm. you know, as he continues his leadership. Um, this is clear that he's yeah. a leader. And while he's, you know, in asylum, you know, seeking asylum now, mm -hmm. uh, I, I know that he and, and also the folks that you work with and the folks that you are, um, you know, that, that level of leadership is something that is sustained and grows over time. Mm -hmm. So it's yes. an honor and a pleasure to speak to you guys. And thank, thank you for the work that you're doing. Yeah, thank you so much again. Um, very informative. And um, we're actually, we're working with the Instagram public policy team right now to kind of start an Assam Connect Instagram account to further shed awareness for LGBT Assam seekers. So. Um, maybe we can partner together in the future to work on that. I'd love to have um, Jose's insights into that too. Um, Absolutely, and happy to put, I'll link you um, with Michael as well. Oh, great, that'd be, that'd be awesome. Yeah, he's, he's a pretty amazing talent. All yeah, right. Sounds Bye. like it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you too. Bye, nice to meet you. Okay. Um, so now I have a PowerPoint. Um, that I'm just going to pull up on my screen. Give me one second. Can you guys see it? <laughs> Can you see it? Anyone? Caitlin, yeah, your microphone's on. <laughs> yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, so this is a tentative agenda. Um, sorry, I didn't get to go over it before we started. Um, but as you can see, we heard from Chelsea, we heard from Mackenzie. Um, the five minute brief reflection did not happen, um, but that's okay. Uh, we heard from Cheryl, and now there's a possible appearance from a, a third guest speaker, um, the Peace Factory, uh, from 10 to 10 15. But I'm not, I'm not quite 100% sure that they'll be joining us, so we'll just see. Um, but right now, we can just start the discussion, unless anyone has any. Um, immediate thoughts or reactions to any of the guest speakers. <laughs> if not, okay. Um, so we can start. So I just put together some uh, discussion topics and questions that are kind of related to peace and technology. Um, so you can read these questions. Um, what are the best practices for social impact technology when it comes to engaging underserved communities? How do we ensure long-term community impact? And um, some follow-up questions to those. What factors make social technology helpful versus harmful? And then what are some examples of maybe extra considerations that engineers, tech experts, nonprofit leaders, et cetera, might want to take into account before implementing a technologically advanced solution in an underserved community? Does anyone have any um, thoughts on that? Any of those questions? Can address any part. No. Um, there's also like a hand raising function somewhere that might be a little bit easier to use since I cannot see everyone. Or if you have something to say, you can also just take off your microphone. Um, okay, um, well, I have some, I have some thoughts. Um, well, some, for the follow-up questions, I think that it's really important to um, conduct a needs assessment before you go in with any technologically advanced solution. So maybe like assess whether it's culturally competent, whether the beneficiaries actually can use the technology, want to use the technology, um, have access to the technology. I know that in Asylum Connect's case, we had to make sure that the asylum seekers would have access to mobile phones and technology. And so Saeed was able to reassure us about that. And we also conducted interviews with people. I think that's a really important factor to take into account. Um, in terms of what makes factors socially uh, helpful or harmful, again, just helpful, making sure that people can actually use it. Harmful, maybe introducing a type of technology that you know, people don't use or people misuse. You could see how that could be harmful. And any follow-up thoughts? Right now. Um, I, I have something else that I was thinking about, which um, is complicated when it comes to tech stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so especially when it's user generated, there's the challenge of 
what information is true, what does it mean to kind of keep things accurate or true. Um, and I'm curious in this case how that is monitored. Um, and I imagine just broadly when it comes to these kinds of initiatives, how do you measure and keep track of what information that is user generated is considered authentic or true um, enough to reshare. So that's just another challenge that I wanted to add. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, can you still see the screen? Yeah. Um, so I had just an example of a technology that I think is personally interesting. I don't know if all of you have heard of Kiva. Um, it's an online lending platform, um, and they basically just use technology in an innovative way to help a very underserved population. So they have a pretty simple platform. They ask people to choose a borrower, make a loan, get repaid, um, and then repeat. And they've achieved a really high rate doing this with very, very impoverished populations. And they're actually one of the fastest growing nonprofits in history, which is interesting. Um, so yeah, their entire mission is to empower people with, around the world with a $25 loan. And so they're basically, they're using the internet in an interesting way um, to help, again, underserved population. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on that? I just, I think it's interesting in terms of applying a new model like lending and giving it to a more impoverished population. But I do know that they've um, had some bad negative feedbacks all organizations do um, in terms of, you know, maybe the population doesn't fully understand what's going on or lo the loan process. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on Kiva? No. <laughs> it looks, it looks like someone a had a comment. On the group chat. Okay. Yeah, sorry, it's like hard for me to look at all of it. What kind of repercussions are there, if any, um, oh, yeah, that's if a, loans aren't paid back? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So actually, um, during the Millennium Campus Conference, any of you were there, uh, one of the Kiva, someone who worked at Kiva actually addressed that question, because that is, you know, the obvious question. Um, and actually, since they're working with such a vulnerable, impoverished population, the answer is actually nothing. Kiva doesn't actually, it's a nonprofit, they don't actually go after anyone. They kind of just um, take people at their word. And again, they've achieved a very, very high rate of repayment, which is really good. But in terms of sustainability, yeah, I imagine that is pretty um, kind of risky. So yeah, great question. Um, I'd be curious to hear anyone's thoughts about, you know, maybe, you know, they do nothing. If that's a smart move by Kiva, or maybe kind of a silly move, or kind of a um, risky move, even though they have achieved the, the rate, theoretically, if no one pay back the loans tomorrow, they wouldn't be able to kind of sustain themselves. Any thoughts on that? But yeah, good question, Caroline, thank you. Any last thoughts before we move on to the next topic? No? Okay. No? A risky move, but if there's a trust build between the community. Yeah, seriously, yeah, that's another good point. So Caroline, if everyone wants to look at the chat, she said a risky move, but if there's a trust build between the community and the organization, it's a great idea. I think that's another important point. Obviously, Kiva has very good local partnerships um, with these people, and I think probably word of mouth, um, and not even technology probably in those type of environments, but yeah, more word of mouth in terms of um, assessing Kiva's impact and making sure that people actually repay the loans. So yeah, I think that really speaks to um, partnership, like Mackenzie was saying before. Yeah, so definitely agree with that. Any last thoughts? Sorry, it's like hard. I can't see some of you, so <laughs> I can't see if anyone's raising their hand. But um, okay, we can move on. Um, so the next kind of topic was actually what Mackenzie kind of touched upon in her presentation already. So slacktivism versus, versus actually creating meaningful social media change, which is very important nowadays given the many different social platforms that people can just post on. 
Yep, yep. Sorry. Okay, so slacktivism, what is slacktivism? Um, it's defined as actions performed via the internet in support of a political or social cause, but regarded as requiring little time or involvement, e.g. signing an online petition or joining a campaign group on a social media website. Um, any questions about that general concept? I actually wasn't familiar with the term myself, so if anyone has any, needs any clarification, uh, just let me know. No? So I guess the question is, and Mackenzie, again, she talks a little bit about it, and then so did Cheryl, but um, what really separates slacktivism from meaningful social change? I think that a lot of people talk about it like it's a, just, you know, a very clear divide, but I actually think that um, it's not such a clear divide, that maybe it's a little bit more blurry. So, for example, a lot of people, again, use online petitions as kind of an example of slacktivism, but online petitions can also be extremely successful if you get it into the hands of the right people and you get enough signatures. So I think it's a debatable point. So does anyone have any thoughts on that? Maybe what factors can contribute to slacktivism or maybe it's more of an attitude versus actually going out there and creating meaningful social change. Any thoughts? Um, okay, well, um, again, meaningful social change, I think, is really an opinion, um, and I think that, you know, acts that are usually um, kind of thought of as slacktivism can be turned into meaningful social change, but that's just my opinion. Okay. Rena? Rena said it's hard to measure the difference, but sometimes changing mindsets does happen in small moments. Yeah, I definitely agree. Mm-hmm. Any other thoughts on that, on those questions before we move on? No? Okay. Well, um, I actually, I wanted to talk about a, kind of a recent example from Facebook. So actually, in my news feed this morning, a Huffington Post article kind of popped up, and it said that basically in the past, Facebook has given photo filters for causes like gay marriage, France after recent attacks, um, but the filters that they offer are actually really limited. And so recently, users have been criticizing Facebook, asking, you know, why can't I change my profile picture to show solidarity with the people of Beirut? Um, and so there's actually a new tool called Lunapic, which is a free online photo editor that will now allow you to superimpose multiple flags over your profile picture, so you can actually show your support for more than one nation. Um, so I guess I was wondering if anyone had any thoughts about Facebook. First, um, Facebook's kind of lack of, you know, letting people um, filter Beirut, um, and maybe what kind of factored in that decision, ex like exclusive decision, and why maybe they wouldn't offer that flag, or if it's a, a good or a, a bad decision. <laughs> Any thoughts on Facebook? I know it sparked, it sparked rage in my news feed. Um, people are definitely angry that you could only support France, or confused at least. I don't know if any of you guys have any opinions on that. Uh, yeah, I have an opinion on the filters of, on Facebook. Okay, great. Um, is Caroline speaking? I don't know. <laughs> uh -huh. Sorry, yeah, I can't see you, but I can see your name. <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't turn my video on. Um, well, while the flags and the filters raise awareness and you know, people say, what's going on with those? Um, uh -huh. I think it's sort of a lazy way. It's it, it, like slacktivism of sending out a message but not really being able to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. in that way. Yeah, sure. That's, yep, that's definitely a valid opinion. Um, I, yeah, I mean, like, what does changing your Facebook photo actually do? I think is a, is a good question, if anything. Um, I know some people, you know, sometimes they'll change a Facebook photo and then they'll put a link to a charity um, to, like, donate to that cause. I think that's effective or more effective. And then I guess just playing the devil's advocate, I think that if you change your – if enough people change their pictures, I think that it's basically – it's showing people that people um, – 
should at least like read about it, which I guess is better than nothing. But I definitely, I definitely see your point of view that it might seem a little bit lazy, like they're not really doing anything. Um, does anyone, you know, disagree with Caroline? Agree with Caroline? Have any thoughts? <laughs> Other thoughts about the filtering? It's a very current issue. I know. I know I keep on talking, but no, please do. I <laughs> um, keep on talking. <laughs> um, so this is sort of a, a horizontal connection. Um, I heard on NPR yesterday. Um, so Facebook has this thing where you can mark yourself safe during yeah. some sort of event. Um, and so there was a lot of uproar because um, on Saturday that was something that they turned on so people in Paris could mark themselves as safe. Mm -hmm. um, and past events included the earthquake in Nepal, in Nepal and um, sort of environmental disasters. Yeah. Um, and so the reason that I brought it up is because in the interview they were talking to Mark Zuckerberg and he was saying um, they hadn't ever done it before for, um, for an event like this and there was a lot of anger because why, why Paris and not Beirut, for example, or, or other, um, other examples of, of this kind of um, challenging situation. Um, and he was saying, well, there has to be a first time for everything. So this was marking a transition to the first step in involving this other kind of activism on mm -hmm. Facebook. Um, but what it got me thinking about is that um, they probably weren't thinking about it that intentionally when they decided mm -hmm. to um, put it on for Paris. But it was yeah. in the reaction that they started to think about the implications. And I think that that's something that's really, really powerful about social media um, mm -hmm. is to lend weight and depth to actions that sometimes don't take a lot of weight or depth to make. Yeah. So it creates a conversation where there might not have been one before. Um, and so this is another example with the flags, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. What does it mean to kind of diversify the, the image that you project of yourself to represent other, other experiences? So that was just another thing I was thinking about. Yeah, thank you. That's, yeah, definitely related. And yeah, I remember seeing myself about the safety feature. Um, you actually get notified if some of your friends are featured. So it's like very, very noticeable. Um, and I definitely agree that just changing the flags is like if you're on Facebook, there's no way you're not going to know what happened in Paris, which I think is a good thing. Um, and then other causes like, um, you know, gay marriage and stuff like that, stuff like legislative action. I think that it can be useful as well to kind of sway people's opinions in a meaningful way. Um, but yeah, definitely. Um, same thing. Sorry if I can. Yeah, no, please. Yeah. Um, no, something um, um, that um, a friend was mentioned um, that it kind of relates to this. Um, the unfortunately, um, I think it was Mackenzie who discussed the, the ice bucket challenge, but I don't know if she's still here. Um, but with the ice bucket challenge, um, she mentioned that it was beneficial because it raised awareness for. Um, you know, for the, for the cause, like it was kind of out there um, uh -huh. and you know, everyone was doing it. Um, but I guess um, part of, I think, um, or something else that, like, that comes up is like whether or not the Facebook photo or the Facebook like location, um, you know, like safe, safety, mm -hmm. um, is that, do we think it, like it has the same, like it play the same role, I guess? Um, or like, is that more like slacktivism? Um, like, how do we define that? I mean, it yeah. raised awareness for the cause, but um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. I think, again, I think that for me, I think I would kind of define the like the safety feature as less of slacktivism. It's more of like an action. I know that if I like knew anyone in Paris, that would be like it would feel like a nice action if you like mark yourself safe. Um, but in terms of the profile picture. I, don't, I think it's honestly, I think it's kind of dependent on the cause. I think that people, I, I mean, like, it's a nice intention to change your profile picture, I guess, your lens to support people in different countries. But um, I think that more, like, cause, like, again, like, if you can take a legislative action or you can, like, sway people's opinions um, in one way or another, I think it's a little bit more effective in terms of filtering than maybe changing your, your profile picture after an attack. I mean, I, I do, I mean, like, it's a nice gesture, but I'm not sure if it, does it like does as much as people think it does um other oh, than gosh. yeah other than like um if the entire news feed again is you know paris flags it, it makes people aware of what just happened and actually have to deal with like what's happening in the world so i think that's a good thing um 
what I mean yeah that's a great question yeah I think um, I think it, yeah in response to that um, mm -hmm. I think I agree that um, I, I think it would, have been, it would have been a little more effective had they tied it to a specific like donation platform or yeah mm -hmm. like, change your profile picture um, like a caption automatically like right the, yeah mm -hmm. uh, only to donate um, but yeah no it was just something to think about but even you know even with Paris, you know, the discussion of, again, those other countries, um, like, yeah. at what point are we able to decide, like, what's worth donating, what's worth, like, advocating for, like, automatically, um, mm -hmm. you know, by, by terms of a, a filter on Facebook, so, something to think about, but. Yeah, no, yeah, definitely, I think that's a really good question, that's a question that I've seen a lot of people in my Facebook community discussing, or, like, the controversy over, you know, why France over Peru, and, like, why does Facebook get to decide that? Um, and that's where, you know, the new technology, Ludipic, comes in and now gives people the freedom to pick whichever flag they want, which I think is kind of a nice gesture and it's free. And I think, for me, I think when I saw the Ludipic thing, I was like, that's a really good use of technology. It's a good idea. Um, like, why not? Uh, people should be, like, freedom of expression, I guess. But um, I was, I don't know, I was interested in it. Like, why would Facebook do that, I guess, not offer it? Like, why wouldn't Facebook have done, because it has the resources, why wouldn't they have done what Ludipic did in the, in the first place, maybe, I, I mean, like, I don't know, maybe they want, they want to have that effect where people can only choose a certain amount of, like, filters at one time so that the newsfeed is covered with one filter. I think that maybe, like, Lunapec runs the risk of, you know, if you can choose anything, people are not going to necessarily choose the same thing, and then it will just look strange. But, I mean, that's just my opinion. Um, any last thoughts on Paris, Facebook, Lunapec, um, filters? before we move on? No? Okay. Um, well, the other guest speaker was supposed to tune in at 10. Um, I don't think they're here yet. Um, they're called the Peace Factory, and actually if they, I was kind of expecting them not to tune in because they didn't answer my last email, but I thought we could talk about them because I think they're very interesting. Um, so that was my next slide. So yeah, the, they're called the Peace Factory, and their mission is really to make peace viral. So their work is dedicated um, to connecting people through social media, which is kind of what we've been talking about this entire time. And they ask people to share their stories and perspectives on their website. So if you want, you can go to their website right now and kind of take a look. And they also sell peace-related merchandise, um, like t-shirts, and they say wear it, spread it. So I mean, that's kind of an interesting way we've been talking about um, spreading through social media, but they're actually doing it in person as well, which is an interesting concept. Um, does anyone have any basic questions about the Peace Factory? at this moment. It's basically just like a website where it shares stories. Um, also like, it's, it's kind of like the Where Love is Legal campaign, where people are posting like photos, and then you get kind of a human face on the cause. So, um, so yeah, a little bit more about them. Um, they advertise for war, we advertise for peace, that's one of their slogans, kind of a catchy slogan. Um, and they just ask people, in terms of action steps, it's pretty simple. Just take a camera, a phone, and upload your story. 30 seconds to one minute, just a glimpse. And they say, they make a bold claim it will change the world. I put that there because, again, we've been talking about um, like what actually is meaningful, what actually can change the world. And so they actually post videos such as, Iranians, we love you, a message to Iran from Israel. And they ask, share with us your story. Let's show the world that we are real people. Um, so kind of actually what Cheryl was saying about you know putting a human face and treating people like people. That's kind of a similar theme, um, but they do make that kind of um, heavy claim. So, yeah. <laughs> so Raina said in the chat, I don't know much about it, but that sounds like it could easily just be slacksism. I wonder how people connect in real life. It's a good question. Yeah, so like for campaigns like this, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was recently introduced to these people, um, but they have been featured in a lot of major publications, which I think is interesting. And then in terms of, I think of, you know, the Where Love is Illegal campaign is the obvious um, kind of draw. And that campaign is entirely photos, but it's done really well in terms of um, raising awareness for LGBT rights. So I think that a lot of people could call that socialism, but I don't know. I think that, for, like, for the video, the Iranians, um, we love you, a message to Iran from Israel, I think that might be powerful if it's seen by the right people, I think marketing strategy would be very important here because if you, you know, live in one of those countries and you, you're told from birth to hate a certain person and then you see a video of being like, I love you, I think it could change. I think it's an interesting concept 
and it could have the power to change. Um, but yeah, people meeting in real life, I think, isn't really their focus. I think it's way more connecting and talking over social media. Um, so yeah, I pulled up some interesting quotes from them. So they say peace really starts with a conversation. Um, so it says, today it's easier than ever to connect and reach out to one another. Um, we can talk, we can meet, and we can start a new friendship without even leaving our homes just by the click of a button. One new person, one new connection. Peace is where we see and treat each other as people. All we have to do is talk. So again, I put this up here because it's kind of like a provocative. Um, like when I first read it, I was like, that seems very simplistic to me. And it's defining peace as, you know, when, like, just a conversation. And I thought it was an interesting opinion. So anyone have any reactions, immediate reactions to that? Kind of a social media conversation, not even like an in-person conversation. Um, no reactions? No media reactions? Okay. I actually <laughs> have one. Yes. Okay. I think Great. It's really interesting that um, the Peace Factory sees this um, kind of social media setting as being more conducive to like human interaction when a lot yeah. of people mm -hmm. seems like being behind a screen sometimes leads people to leave like hurtful comments or say things that they otherwise wouldn't be like right. they would say face to face. Um, so I just think that's really interesting. I think I more often hear that the screen is more detrimental than helpful. Like yeah. Peace Factory seems to think. Mm -hmm. So I just thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you for bringing that up. I think one of the interesting things the Peace Factory does is it's working with people that, you know, you can't go over the border. It would be dangerous to go in, like, a different country. So I think they're using the social media instead of, like, as a barrier in, to, like, a segue or a platform, like a virtual reality where you can actually talk to people or you're never really going to get the chance to talk to them in person. Um, so I think that they're kind of looking at social media in the most optimistic light, definitely. Um, and technology in general, but yeah, I mean that's definitely a really really good point and something to think about um, um, Is there anyone from the peace factory on the call right now? Any peace factory team members? <laughs> No? Okay. If, if so, just uh, let me know. Because um, we can't see you. We can only see names. So. Okay. Um, something else that I just found interesting. Um, so they say kind of um, that one of the ways to promote peace is humanizing the enemy. So once you see your enemy as a human being, similar to yourself, being expressing his love and understanding. He doesn't hate you as you're the propagandist seeks to make you believe. You can never go back to blind hate, then you can start to know each other and you'll be ready for peace. Um, so I, yeah, I think um, personally that that's, that was an interesting quote to me because in terms of Asylum Connect, that's one thing that we're trying to do is put a human face on global LGBT rights and LGBT Asylum seekers because a lot of people, you know, they don't think about that or they just kind of believe something from a very early age. And I think that, Something powerful for me um, was having people share, if people stand up and share their story, it's a lot harder to hate them. And I think that from the experiences I've had and heard from LGBT asylum seekers myself, I think that's actually very true. And I think social media can be a very effective platform to get people to listen to your story, um, kind of like who never would otherwise, such as YouTube. You can go on YouTube and listen to a lot of different stories and hear a lot of different perspectives. So... I was wondering if anyone else had um, any thoughts on that. You know, humanizing the enemy is kind of an avenue to peace through social media. Okay, so Caroline said, I don't like the idea of having an enemy. We're all people, some people, different views and life experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that's really what they're saying. Like, when they say the enemy, I think they're kind of, you know, saying what you're saying about there shouldn't be an enemy because we're all people. So, yeah, definitely. Great point. 
Does anyone else have a thought of kind of using the terminology of the enemy? Or humanizing, or we're all people, or how effective, or kind of advantages or disadvantages of thinking like that. I guess that I would think about this being kind of like the first, the first step. Um, mm -hmm. That it seems like if we put up these boxes and barriers. We categorize people as our enemy or as our friend. Um, so this is sort of getting past the box so that you can have the deeper conversation. Mm -hmm. um, which is super important, and I think storytelling is a really powerful component of that. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's why I was noting before what happens next. How do you actually get yeah. beyond just breaking down the barrier to actually creating mm -hmm. a real connection or a real relationship? And, um, and understanding why people come to the perspectives that they do, because um, one thing that happens when we say someone is an enemy is that we kind of erase the fact that they are intelligent people who yeah. want to their perspective for reasons that are real and so how do we kind of make that happen. But um, but yeah, this actually feels connected to what one of our earlier speakers was talking about in terms yeah. of um, seeing people as people and um, finding ways for them to feel a human connection to a story. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I that was what I thought too, like what Cheryl was saying about how to grow your fan base by, or user base by creating everyone like a person. I definitely think that's really good advice in terms of digital strategy. Um, so, yeah, my next slide was kind of like similar. So just some questions that we kind of already answered, but if anyone else has any other thoughts on them, please feel free. Um, so I can read them. Um, can posting a video or selfie change the world? Is lack of communication one of the primary drivers of peace? And what would happen if we talk more with people of different cultures slash nationalities? Um, I think those are some of the questions that I had when I, I read those quotes. Um, and they're, I mean, they're kind of, they seem clear cut, but I think a lot of the questions are blurry. Um, again, in terms of posting a video or selfie, change the world. Um, so uh, the first guest, Mackenzie, she was talking about the It Gets Better project, and that project really is a bunch of, a collection of, of selfies and videos and I think that it's done a lot like that cause is very conducive to that type of social media um, in terms of raising awareness for LGBT youth and letting them know that it gets better um, maybe in years where it was a little bit harder maybe um, so I think that's that's kind of an example that I would give of a selfie video being very uh, maybe life-changing for someone who's watching it um, does anyone have any thoughts about that using video, video platforms or pictures uh, in terms of changing the world? No? Okay. Um, any thoughts on the other two questions? Um, actually, I do have, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> so talk, go ahead. Hey, hi. So uh, I, I just had one small question here. I, I yeah. joined the call with too late. I, uh, okay. I'm so Apologies for that, you know. Oh, no Thank it you is. for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But the point is, uh, yeah, so like, uh, you know, you guys talking about a video actually being used as a proper tool for, you know, create, for actually impacting change. But mm -hmm. I am quite, a, I am unfortunately a bit too skeptical about it because, you know, um, although it does help in creating awareness, I don't mm -hmm. know if this instrument of awareness can actually end up in creating a positive impact. Impact mm -hmm. is a bigger word. Impact is something that happens on the ground. Impact is something that's measurable. That's, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's distinct of things between the before and the after. So today if I post a video here and I'm expecting a change in Eritrea or uh, Uganda because I'm talking about something here, mm -hmm. impact might not be the best thing that I, I would want to, uh, you know, gain from a video. A video would probably be, uh, the terminology for a video that could be used is awareness, I believe, because awareness is something that can be associated with the video, not impact creation. That's just my uh, views. About yeah, it. no, thank you. That, yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's a great point. I think, yeah, I think I agree that like videos are definitely kind of more geared towards awareness and that it would be challenging to create like an impact campaign with, with, like off of a video platform, like you were saying. Um, maybe like an example of something that did, like Mackenzie said about the, 
ALS ice bucket challenge. So that was kind of a, a selfie competition. But if you didn't do it, it was an impact kind of because you had to raise money or donate money. So I think that would be like a measurable outcome, um, how many videos were posted and how much money was raised through that. But I definitely do agree that it's definitely more awareness uh, oriented. Um, but I, mean, I think maybe an interesting concept would be how to make it more impact oriented because um, I think that'd be effective. Maybe like if you put like an action step after the video, that would make it more impact oriented like on the ground. Um, but I mean, yeah, great point. Does anyone have any other um, reactions or comments about that? Um, yeah, I think this is relating to the first bullet point. Uh -huh. um, it's kind of easy to make fun of the whole um, selfie movement that we see today, and I'm definitely yeah. <laughs> guilty of this myself. Uh -huh. but I think that, in a sense, it allows people to become their own, in a way, like news reporters. Um, they take control of the lens that you're viewing them through. Um, a lot of times it seems like media is maybe not completely transparent or objective. And selfies could potentially be a way to avoid um, yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I think um, selfies are definitely a way of people using technology in whichever, whatever way they want. I think that also um, YouTube is another really interesting platform because people can put up whatever they want basically uncensored. So in terms of not being um, kind of edited by the media, um, yeah, I think that technology can definitely be a good avenue to connect with people. I think for me, the question is, it becomes not kind of what they're saying, but how they get people to watch their videos. So the peace factor, if they're on this call, I'd ask them about marketing because I think that their videos are really interesting, but I think the videos are only making, you know, an impact if they're being watched by the kind of the right people or their target, target audience. So I'd be interested to see how they would measure that. So that was one of my questions for them, but unfortunately they're not here. <laughs> so maybe next time. Um, any other thoughts about these, these questions or the peace factory in general, kind of their premise, how they, like, how they're thinking about peace as a conversation. Um, through social media. I would also be curious who participates um, mm -hmm. in these conversations. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Certainly peace is something that we all have to participate in regardless of where we are. Um, but I do wonder if it ends up being kind of like the same challenge that we've thought about before, that the same people yeah. all, who are already a part of these spaces who are mm -hmm. already sharing these stories and are interested in seeing them and hearing them. Um, and how do they, I guess that's related to your question of outreach, how do they yeah. um, get other people to, to be a part of the conversation too? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely agree with that. I think that's one of the things that Sam Connect is kind of trying to deal with is kind of reaching more of a mainstream audience. So before I co-founded Sam Connect, I'd actually met Saeed, I actually never had heard of an LGBT Assam seeker. And I, I don't think that's rare. I think that a lot of people don't know what Assam seeker is. So for us, it's kind of how how do we pull in not just, you know, LGBT people or the LGBT community, but also like more of the mainstream or, you know, general public or the people that would actually have a problem with LGBT Assam seekers. I think that's like a, an interesting challenge, kind of something that you were saying in, in relation to Assam Connect. Because um, it's hard to convince those people of a different opinion, even through videos or um, writing. So I think it can be, I think it can be effective if done correctly, but I also think that some people's biases will unfortunately kind of prevent them from watching it full, fully through or, you know, reading the entire article or something like that. So, example from the sound <laughs> Um Yeah, so those are all like the kind of topics that I had planned for today. Um, but does anyone have any reflections or thoughts on the guest speaker's presentations? Um, I found them really interesting, personally. Um, but I did pick them, so <laughs> I'm biased. <laughs> um, but anything you guys liked or didn't like, lingering questions, thoughts, um, people, you know, what did they do well? Should I have picked other people? Hopefully not. Um, <laughs> any thoughts? <laughs> no? <laughs> 
One thing that I thought was interesting was that since we just ended by saying um, it's important to get people in the conversation who wouldn't otherwise be in the conversation. Yeah. Um, I appreciated that the speakers that you pulled were not necessarily people who focus on LGBTQ. Activity. Yeah, I did that yeah, on purpose, yeah. <laughs> um, and so it's, I think it's really important to think about the intersections of expertise. And so I thought that was great that you, um, that you brought in some people who have expertise in one area, which is of value to this conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's not explicitly something they've already done, but maybe that mm -hmm. means that they will do it now. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree that um, I don't like, I think when you're building organization, you shouldn't just have one specific type of person. I think you need like a wide diversity of interests and obviously, you know, for Islam can actually look for people that are interested in LGBT rights or willing to work on them, obviously. But I think that also, um, I went to like the LGBT accelerate event for Google and there was a bunch of Googlers. Um, Mackenzie was actually there. She helped run it. Um, but not all of them were kind of focused on LGBT rights. It was more of like a tech community that was interested in socially impactful technology and that they saw an overlap with the LGBT community, like you were saying before. So I think, I definitely think it's important. That's another way that maybe you can pull other people outside of your circles into the conversation by kind of looking at secondary interests. Um, so. Yeah, and I also, um, I thought that the presentation at the beginning that Chelsea gave was also really a beautiful connection, it turned yeah. out, to mm -hmm. the conversations that followed, talking about SMART goals and objectives. Um, so much of any kind of outreach is so tied to how do you, what are you actually working towards um, because outreach can get kind of out, out of hand and so how do you keep it tied and measure um, the effects of the work that you're doing and so um, especially when it comes to digital activism, how do you create those smart goals and objectives in a way that's useful. Um, so that I thought yeah. was also a great connection. Now I'll stop talking. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. Great job, Chelsea. Um, yeah, very, very relevant. Um, does anyone else have any, any thoughts on the guest speakers? Any thoughts on Cheryl? I, I personally really like Cheryl's, um, what Cheryl said about the human connection and treating you as like people because I do think personally from experiences seeing other nonprofits, especially older nonprofits, that it's definitely more of a cog in the system type of approach, which is interesting. Um, so I think that's kind of a really good piece of advice. And she's had a very successful career. So um, oh, thank you, Chelsea. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, any lingering, and lingering questions about any of the topics? So I know we talked about digital marketing, um, the piece, the piece factory, uh, had someone from Google. Um, and if you guys missed any of it, I think Julian's recording it, so you can definitely watch it later. Um, and some of them have, like, uh, Mackenzie had a nice PowerPoint presentation, so be easy to follow. And she also put up her contact information. She would probably be useful to a lot of people in terms of being a marketing manager at Google. I think she has have a lot of insights about how to create really targeted campaigns. Um, no, no last questions? About the guest speakers? No. Um, so then any, any other topics related to peace and technology? Anyone's interested in discussing? It can be broad. Um. <laughs> it can be really anything. I mean, there's a lot to talk about the peace and technology in the current events of the global refugee crisis in Paris. Um, Peace is definitely something that's a very current topic. So, like, you could talk about how um, to use technology to kind of create safety for asylum seekers or refugees, or you could talk about, you know, creating peaceful social media campaigns. Um, a lot of a lot of different avenues. Uh, just a little snippet of information I found out yesterday. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, so in terms of the Paris thing, what, whatever happened, so after that, you know, the anonymous hacktivist group, yeah, uh, they actually, you know, let out a public video saying that we're going on an all-out war against the Islamic State. And then they actually went out to suspend um, 1,500 Twitter accounts of, you know, different Islamic State mem members. You know? oh, wow. so, that was, so that was pretty cool in itself. 
So yeah. I guess technology really comes in there, you know, it's basically soft wars now. It's not really about sending an army into another country and, you know, breaking down borders and, you know, really yeah. bombing, that, bombing the place out there. It's more about information warfare that we see nowadays. What also China, uh, like in China today, it's called informationization. They use a term called informationization by which they say that um, the more advanced a country gets, the more internet interlinked and internetworked that country gets as a result of which everything gets connected to each other. And all that you need to do as one country is to identify the acupuncture points in the other countries. You know, mm-hmm. if, you yeah. can attack, if you can attack those particular weaklings, the whole country, country comes crumbling down. So according to China, according one of the strategies apparently says, apparently is that, you know, like, you know, if you have to defeat somebody in a war, you have to defeat him in the first 15 minutes. And that's by breaking down the technological apparatus that the whole country is built upon. So I guess technology is really helping both in, you know, uh, eliminating terrorism as can be seen from the hacktivist group's video. Mm-hmm. And also, it's, it's also an amazing tool for actually terrorists and so yeah. on and so forth for other countries to actually go on an offensive. So it's helping both groups right now. I yeah. guess it's... Mm-hmm. I guess it's a race right now, you know, who, who, whoever is going to have the better technology is going to probably have the last say. That's probably what's working on. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Yeah, I think that's definitely changing the landscape of how war is conducted. Um, going off of fear, yeah, I think that terrorists can definitely use it as a fear tactic, you know, posting the videos, posting threats like we've seen, um, like Penn or like a school in Philadelphia, not Penn, but a general school in Philadelphia just got like a bomb threat because someone posted it like on, on the internet in a, in a group chat. So I think that a lot of, um, yeah, it can, it can definitely be a, like a fear tactic and nothing ended up happening, thank God, but you know, they can mess with people. And so, yeah, I think there's a good and bad to it and it will definitely change the landscape of war. So I agree. Definitely agree. Um, any other to- thoughts or topics? about peace, about, I can answer questions about Sound Connect, or we can start brainstorming topics for the next webinar, which could be interesting. Um, yeah, I actually yeah. have a question Yeah. about, you mentioned the Instagram project that you yeah. up. I was just wondering if you could give a little bit more background on what that I was. could. I think I have a slide. Do I have a slide? I do. Um, yeah, so I, we, so one of my, um, friends from middle school, actually, um, she works at Instagram public policy team. And so they reached out to Sam Connect looking, um, they partner with organizations and nonprofits that they think are, um, trying to raise awareness for really important global issues because Instagram is actually mostly a global platform. Um, so they've asked us to, to, or kind of come to us to help us launch an Sam Connect Instagram account with, um, you know, with concept, content and concept and um, they've given us a lot of cool insights. Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to share everything, but I'll just go over what we're thinking. And then if anyone has feedback, love to hear it. Um, so the concept was Saeed, my um, co-founder and co-director, he had the idea. So from his own experience, he, he was like, um, he thought it'd be cool if we took the video or a picture content based um, platform um, to ask the sound seekers to actually take pictures of their shadows and then we promote it, and we, we post it on our Instagram account, and it com- becomes easy content for asylum seekers and for us, because it promotes visibility while actually protecting their confidentiality, which is really important for asylum seekers. And so when we were kind of uh, thinking of this idea, um, we didn't want to recreate the Where Love's Illegal campaign. I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but that's what I was talking about before. It's done a fantastic job of really shedding awareness on LGBT um, global rights, not asylum seekers in particular, but global LGBT issues. And people, they ask people to take pictures and a lot of them, you know, people cover their faces or um, do really creative ways to hide their identity. Um, but then they share their stories and it's like, it's done really well. So, but we're trying to specifically shed awareness for LGBT asylum seekers and asylum connect. So we think the shadows um, in terms of asylum seekers is a good idea. And then we're also, um, we're trying to create a corresponding catchy and unique hashtag. So with the shadows. So some ideas we had were shadows to safety or solidarity 
not showers. <laughs> I don't know why I said showers. Um, solidarity shadows. Um, but we're working on creating a unique hashtag. But yeah, Instagram, I, we're definitely excited by that because we think that picture can be a very effective way because in terms of what Cheryl was saying about putting a human face on the cause and treating people like people, I think that's extremely important for our cause. And even if we can't show their faces, just showing their shadows, I think it's also still pretty like personal um, and just sharing their stories. We want to share statistics and quotes and anything really that can help people understand the struggles that they're going through um, and get people more involved in Asylum Connect. Um, so yeah, I had a question in the bottom. How can Asylum Connect leverage the power of technology to raise awareness? That's a very broad question. Um, but yeah, we, we chose Instagram because, well, because it came to us, but also because it's a global platform and we like the photo content. We think it's an interesting challenge and that it can reach a new audience for us because um, being more, having more of a global audience and a younger audience, I think, is different than going on LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook. So um, also unique hashtags do really well. Um, it can bring a lot of people into your organization. So yeah, that's a little bit about where we stand for Instagram. We're hoping to launch in um, January. So it'll definitely be over our Facebook po page and um, keep you updated about the launch. <laughs> but if anyone has any ideas or for us about you know content or a hashtag, we'd love to have. We'd love to hear it. Julian, did that answer your question? <laughs> yes, that was okay. great. I love the shadows to safety. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I really like the shadow idea when Saeed said that. This is very interesting. I haven't seen anything like this before, so it'll definitely be a so. incredible way of using Instagram. Yeah, I mean, I just think that, like, for us, like, awareness is a very big issue. It's, it's a secondary issue to providing the life-saving resource, but in terms of um, getting the cause and getting the people the resources and money that they deserve, you need to increase awareness because you need to get the attention of, you know, the funders and, you know, maybe the more important, stereotypically important people or people in power who can actually give people, you know, housing and food. So I think that awareness is not only because, you know, they deserve to be aware, like, um, deserve awareness, but also because in terms of helping them, like, actually, like you said before, um, Samantak, um, about having, a, like, an on-the-ground impact, I think awareness is secondary, and so that's where I kind of pause and say that slacktivism can actually have an impact, because um, if, it, if it prompts you, if it gets the right person to see it, I think that it can make all the difference, so I don't, I don't think it's a very clear-cut answer. That's why, I kind of, that's why I picked the topic for the webinar. I think it's interesting, having peace in technology. So, Does anyone else have any other questions for me about Assam Connect or how we use technology or how we're hoping to use technology to promote peace for Assam seekers? No. Um, well, I do have one slide about it. Um, yeah, so if you're not familiar with Asylum Connect, I'd recommend writing down all this information. Um, so it has my email, our website, um, and also our website has a link to our temporary catalog website where you can actually look at kind of a, a template of what we hope the catalog will look like um, in the future. And so we're actually relaunching the Asylum Connect catalog. Um, it's the first online centralized database of service providers for LGBT asylum seekers in the U.S. We're hoping to relaunch it with new features and a more interactive database than Squarespace in January. So stay tuned for that. Um, it's going to correspond with the Instagram account. So a lot's happening with us in January. Um, but I also encourage anyone to hit the subscribe button on our website for updates. Um, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, follow us on LinkedIn. As you can see, we did not take McKenzie's advice and have a lot of different social media platforms right now. <laughs> and as I said before, the Instagram account is hopefully coming soon. Um, but yeah, we're, we're excited about all those platforms. And uh, yeah, we were, we were kind of ambitious. But I think that we'll probably be focusing more on Facebook and Instagram personally. But yeah. And then if anyone has any you know, insights or ideas about how we can improve our social media content, any feedback is much appreciated. Or, how, or if you want to share your, our pages with your friends because, you know, maybe we won't 
um, they won't see it otherwise, that would also be very much appreciated. I think as, um, oh my goodness, uh, what was her name? The second, not Mackenzie, the second one. Um, Col uh, Cheryl. Cheryl. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think like as Cheryl said, um, I like briefly looked at your website, but um, uh -huh. I think she, you know, she mentioned having um, the, um, like create like making it more personal. Um, yeah. Sort of, mm -hmm. sort of investment. So I don't know if you could even get like mini bios or like, um, like many stories, she said, like create a story so that someone can right. see themselves as a hero. Um, I think you know it can be very difficult um, living in the U.S. to to see that you know um, like to see like how like as an ally, sure, um, but you know how do you identify with that when it's not really um, yeah directly affecting you? So yeah, I'm, like making it more personal. Um, so it's like oh wait, this is um, like, I can identify, I can get it. Like I, now I see why this is um, this could be such a big struggle for someone. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with you. Um, for us, it's harder because we've been trying to, we're a bit new, so we haven't really, we have testimonials, but we haven't put them up yet from a sound secret, which I think can be really powerful, but we're hoping to make some sort of video. Um, again, it's hard because you don't want to give away people's confidentiality. It can be very dangerous for their families back home. But I also think that maybe, like you were saying, maybe if we did a video of like our team talking about why the cause is important to them, we have a wide different, um, like a wide range of people from different backgrounds on our team and definitely not everyone's LGBT. Um, but also like campaign members could talk in that video and say why it's important to them or, um, yeah, I mean, for me, I think it resonates when you have an LGBT assembly, you're actually like standing in front of you and talking about their experience. Cause I think that, um, like as it's a conversation, like as the peace factor was saying, I think, I think they're right in that regard. Like it's hard to hear someone. It's like, it, it sounds very theoretical and almost like it's not true to a lot of people because it's so horrendous and horrifying. Um, so like in our last webinar, we actually had um, one of our advisors speak and she is the first lesbian um, to receive asylum in the US from Mexico. And so she was kind of recounting some of her struggles. And I think it's just eye opening to hear someone who's like actually gone through that. And I think that I think for me, that's kind of the way that I thought that we could connect with people outside the LGBT community. Um, but yeah, I, do you agree that that would be kind of, um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think like the video idea is great. I know that I'm thinking of, um, I think it was like actually a humans of New York post, um, okay. or somebody wanted their, um, like wanted to just remain anonymous. So it was like photos of like, like, like they're like close up of their hands or something. You right. know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Creative. Right? Yeah artistic you know it's um it's not necessarily just like a blurred face um right in that way it's like yeah they're not identifiable but it still makes it more personable um mm -hmm. yeah definitely yeah and I think that's why I liked um or why everyone likes side shadow idea so much because it's I mean it's personal like it's interesting because I actually wrote an article on an asylum speaker from Jamaica and I didn't ask, I asked him for a picture and I didn't tell him like um, I just like do a picture you're comfortable with and he actually did a picture of his like his face blurred out like not blurred out but it like looked like his shadow and so like he did that without me asking for a picture of a shadow so I thought it was interesting um, but yeah humans of New York as I, I, I'm actually surprised we didn't talk about that that's another photo campaign that's been very successful in terms of like everyone knows what humans of New York is and they've really um, sustained their following they have such a big awareness and it's literally just, you know, he goes up to random people and asks them for their story. So it's a very simple premise. Um, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I think it'd be interesting that maybe to discuss like why that's so impactful and why people are so interested in reading, you know, random people's stories on your social media news feed. Because I know I am, like whenever it comes up, I'm always like, oh, what's that? You know, and he like, he puts the most random thing. But it's like, it seems to have like a universal appeal because he's, he's um, not just asking a certain population for their stories. So I don't know. I thought that was interesting. And then in terms of like having an action step, like he's not asking in turn, like as far as I know, he's not asking anyone to like donate to charity or really anything. He's really just posting their pictures and doing a story. And he's been like one of the most successful photo campaigns I think that we've seen in recent years. So I'd be interested to hear anyone's thoughts on that on maybe why, like, should he like, he could even tie like an action step. Like if he put a, a caption, you know, and maybe he does and I'm just not aware of it, but like, you know, take the, uh, like here's something and then puts a, a website that's related to the story. I think that could actually, it can increase traffic 
for a lot of charities or nonprofits. Like if he partnered with them, I think that would be be something. I don't think he actually partners, but um, if they're like, he'll sometimes travel and um, do the same thing, but in other countries. Um, uh-huh. But yeah, I think he, I think it's like his own, uh, like a personal policy um, to not do partnerships. But um, I mean, I'm sure he like similar platforms or similar. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just interesting because he's been so successful that like you know, like Penn has like a like a lot of colleges they have like you know Penn students, like students of Penn or whatever, and like the same platform and everyone like loves it. Mm-hmm. So I think that's another kind of example of people just wanting to hear about other people's stories. Um, and so for me, yeah, when I saw that, that's kind of what spurred our desire to do an Instagram account because apparently on Instagram you can post a photo, but then like National Geographic, you post a photo, you, but then you can like link it to a different article or link it to a much longer story. So I think it's interesting. Um, Marina, any non-American examples? Um, non-American examples of the humans of New York? When did you write that? What time is it? Sorry, that was me. Um, (laughs) I was just curious, um, since I know we do have some people on the line who are not in the U.S., um, and a lot of the examples that we've been talking about are in the U.S., Uh I'm curious if anyone um, has examples of either really successful social media initiatives, projects um, that engage a lot of people maybe in their own country um, or uh, other resources that have to do with whether it's asylum seekers or refugees or immigrants or whatever the case may be. So I just wanted to open that up as an additional thing. It's a good question. Yeah. Anyone have any responses to that? Hey, hi, Samantha Kagan. Hi. Hey, hi. So there's so there's this Facebook page, you know, we actually uh, uh, keep a tab on all the time. It's called The Logical Indian here in India. Yeah. Logical mm-hmm. Indian or the TLI. The basically, uh, what these guys do is like, you know, uh, let's say uh, you've been treated badly by the, you know, by the cabbie or maybe you, know, you went to a restaurant and something bad happened or maybe something happened on the political front in your local area and someone needs to speak up about it. So whenever people contact The Logical Indian, they actually make a photo story out of it, put in a, put in a little description, a little impassioned description. And this is not going to work out. Everybody, you know, please, you know, share the story and so on and so forth. And they write it in such a manner that it you know, really feels interesting, you know, in today's mm-hmm. social media with such a small attention span, you know, yeah. you don't really go on to read a long paragraph, you know, you're like, oh yeah, okay, that's boring. But yeah. they actually make it quite interesting. They make it quite, you know, like they fill it up with a lot of spice and everything. And they actually make it, wow, okay, so this this actually happened. Oh, my God, that's so bad. Yeah. And I won't actually talk about it. You're going to share it on your wall and so on and so forth. You know, that's how the avalanche starts. So, uh, you know, mm-hmm. so basically, the Logical Indian is all about helping the commoner vent out his frustration about everyday, you know, things that's happening in and around us. And which mm-hmm. we, you know, just we basically take it with a, you know, we basically take it as a bitter pill and we just move on with our lives. But then these guys are saying, Hey, you know, you can actually come to us, tell us your story, give us a picture and we're going to, you know, and, and we're going to make your story popular and we're going to get you some help. Just like crowdsourcing people, help yeah. from people, people who know other people, so on and so forth. So it kind of not only helps in creating awareness, but it also kind of, you know, helps in getting a community of people together and harnessing the power of the community to actually cause something else. Yeah, that's a great example. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, again, it, that kind of makes me think um, about Kiva. Again, what I was saying about earlier, like being an online lending platform and using that um, to kind of uh, take technology and bond together a community. Um, like Caroline was saying before, she was asking about the, I think it was Caroline, um, the repayment rate. And like, um, it is so high. And actually, Kiva doesn't go, um, doesn't go after anyone that doesn't, uh, like, repay their loan. So I think, yeah, the community is definitely an interesting aspect of technology being able to bridge together communities and then also like we're saying the pizza factory um communities across different borders so yeah it's a great point thank you for sharing that um anyone else have any other thoughts about non-american examples no well i mean again pizza factory is kind of a non-american example since i think they they work with um, uh, con- countries in conflict, really. Um, 
trying to think of another non-American example. Um, I can email them to you if I think of anything. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like that, that again, that's all I have for today. Um, unless anyone has any other questions for me, again, about peace, technology, uh, Asylum Connect, any other suggestions about um, different, you know, maybe next month or, or January's webinar topic, I'd love to hear them. If not now, you can always email me. Um, I'm very receptive to ideas in terms of webinars and Asylum Connect, so it's always very helpful. And yeah, and this was taped, so if you want to listen to the guest speakers again, definitely do so. But that's, yeah, that's all I have for now, unless anyone has closing thoughts or comments. <laughs> and again, my email's right there. Hopefully you can still see it. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, well it is um, 9.47, so 13 minutes early. I don't know if that's okay. <laughs> but yeah, so if everyone's good, we can, we can all go, and then I'll see you all hopefully in January when our next webinar. So it won't be in December, it will be in January. So it will be twice as good. So <laughs> everyone please join. <laughs> but yeah, thank you to everyone who presented. So thank you Chelsea so much, and Terrain and Julian for helping us organize, and Alex for taking notes, hopefully. <laughs> and for everyone else who joined, thank you. Thank you for leaving. Of course. <laughs> yes, you did a fabulous job, Katie, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, and I hope to see you all again in January. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Okay. I don't have a good evening. <laughs> yeah. Or morning. Yeah, wherever you are. <laughs> all right. Bye, everyone.